Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews live, special live edition, and I am honored, extremely honored, to have our guest into the studio today. He is uh, the leader of the Sinn Féin in the, I'm going to pronounce the name of the, uh, or, uh, the government uh, building that you sit in, the Synod? Not far off. You're w close. Okay. Uh, we, we, we'll talk that out as we get through the interview. There we Chris. go. Uh, <laughs> Senator N uh, Niall Donaghy. Senator Niall, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor. You're very pleasure. welcome. Um, before I get started on the reason why you're in Canada mm -hmm. today, I, 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 I've always started my interviews off with politicians the exact same way. So you're no exception to okay. this. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Niall? Well, I suppose that for me, it I, I probably came from a sense of, of, of being active in my community more so than any you know, vision of serving or, or having an elected role. Um, I, I come from a political family, a, a family that were involved in uh, Irish republicanism and, and, and republican activism at home for, for a long number of years. But I, I think in the first instance, I, I always had an interest in politics. I always had an interest in Irish history. I always had an interest in what was going on around me. I, I grew up in an era that saw the conflict in the north of Ireland coming towards an end, the introduction of peace talks, and then subsequently the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so that was really, that kind of happened in parallel with my formative years. So you had that at the higher macro political level, and then obviously at a more localized level, you had the day-to-day -day community issues um, that every community, uh, every inner city, urban uh, community deals with, and then also the very specific needs of a community that is emerging from conflict and that is a, a emerging from a history of oppression, a history of sectarianism, a history of essentially uh, being uh, treated as second class, and how you overcome all of those uh, universal challenges, but also those very unique uh, challenges. So for me, it was really fundamental questions. It was like, why can't young people in this community that I live in get a house? Why are we politicized in the overtly security way and militarized way that we are? Why are there uh, peace walls dividing my community from the community on the other side uh, of the wall? Uh, why don't we have a football pitch to, to play sports in this community? So it's, 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 it's that, I suppose, bespoke North of Ireland experience, you know, coupled with what I'm sure would be familiar to a lot uh, of your own uh, followers, those day-to-day -day, uh, community uh, regeneration social uh, issues. That, that really steered me towards firstly getting involved uh, with Sinn Féin locally because, to be quite frank, and I would say this, but it, it's true, they were the only political party that I saw uh, in my area that I engaged with, that I was obviously familiar with through my family, and who ultimately actually did any work um, uh, on the ground. So that was important to me, and that's why I made the decision, uh, I suppose, in my teenage years uh, to get involved with, with Sinn Féin. I, I've done some research on you before you've sat down. I haven't done a lot because I try to learn from my guests. Um, you, uh, councillor first, mm -hmm. then Lord Mayor of Belfast, mm -hmm. and then senator. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 you started early in your career, which is very unusual, particularly here in Canada. I'm not sure how it is in Ireland, but in Canada, you don't get a lot of youth that are mm -hmm. uh, stepping up and putting their name on the ballot. Why was it important for you at a young age to get up and say, I want to be a councillor in this election? Well, a, a number of reasons, uh, to, be, to be frank with you, Chris. Uh, I suppose initially, like anyone, I, I didn't, again, as I mentioned, I didn't really see my role uh, in uh, front-laying elected politics. Um, we had a council seat, Sinn Féin uh, gained a council seat in, in 2001, if memory serves me right, and then we lost that council seat in 2005. Um, we had never had a council seat uh, in the area before. Um, we had always come very tantalizingly close, um, but the area that I live in and where our council constituency boundary is, is a predominantly unionist, loyalist uh, constituency. So I very much live in a small Catholic, nationalist, Republican enclave in, in that part of Belfast. So it was always very difficult for us just numerically to have enough votes, enough people there to, to actually hit the back of the net. And in 2001, we did it. Um, we saw the, uh, the change and the difference that that made, having someone specifically f with a voice, being a voice for our uh, community, for our constituency in City Hall, where important decisions were made. Um, and then in 2005, when we lost that 
um, we felt that difference quite acutely, you know, having had it and then having lost it. So when the party approached me in, I think it was late 2005, early 2006 possibly, I can't quite remember, um, maybe 2007 even, um, and asked what I consider taking on the role as the, the party's representative in the constituency, ultimately to go back uh, to try and regain the seat in 2011. Um, and we would have had an earlier election, but there was like a, there was a sort of legislative process going through there that was changing the system of local government. So it delayed council uh, elections for, for, for a year, um, really. So in 2011, I ran and I was elected um, councillor. Um, and, and I got in over quota, <laughs> which <laughs> which we were happy about, um, which surprised me and surprised uh, quite a lot of people, uh, I think. And uh, that was quite a, 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 a big night for me, for my family, um, uh, but also importantly for the community too. Um, so we were determined that we would that we would um, get to work on, on issues that were uh, important to people. Um, before, we can talk about your time as Lord Mayor, but that's not mm -hmm. why you're here. You're here to talk about why you're in Camden. But before we do that, I want to pose this question to you because there probably are some people who will be listening to this later on and even right now who are saying, what's, what's a Sinn Féin? Because we're Canadians. Why, why would, what, what is this political party? Because we're used to liberal, conservative, mm. NDP. So in your words, what does the Sinn Féin stand for and what does it represent? Well, we stand for core, I suppose, Irish Republican uh, politics and republicanism in its truest sense, um, that the people are sovereign, that uh, we ha create a society where people are equal, um, where, uh, I suppose, in, in you know, the modern understanding of Irish Republicanism, I think, would be very uh, open, uh, very progressive, very international in terms of our, uh, uh, and this is actually a trait of Irish Republicanism going back a very long time. We have always looked internationally for solidarity and for support, whether that was in terms of liberation struggle and, and nation building, whether that was in terms of, of our peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, or even if it's nigh, where we have looked for international solidarity in terms of Brexit um, and protecting the peace process, ensuring that the protocol uh, prevails, and also now the, 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 the fundamental reason as to why I'm here building uh, continued support for Irish reunification and engaging the Good Friday Agreement provision for a referendum uh, on, on that issue. So we envisage a fair Ireland, we envisage a united Ireland, we envisage a, a real republic um, that treats citizens uh, equally, that treats them well, um, that provides them with the fundamentals uh, in life, a good home, uh, a, a, an accessible job, uh, a proper universal uh, and free healthcare system uh, for people. You you are on a cross Canada tour, and I shouldn't say you because there is another uh, member of the uh, another sender uh, from Ireland that is also, mm -hmm. but on the other side of yeah. Canada, you've got the west side. They, uh, she's got the east side. Yeah. Um, why Canada? Why why come to Canada? Because I think that's the big question that I had when I saw this organization. It's like it seems weird that you're coming to Canada. You think you'd stay more in a European sense, mm -hmm. but you've come to Canada and part of the. And I want to make sure I get this name correct here. The uh, Friends of the Sinn Féin, uh, Sinn Féin uh, Canada. So mm -hmm. why, why come to Canada? Well, I suppose the question is why not come to Canada? Um, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and, and, and to be honest, I mean, as I say, and, and I don't say it kind of lately, uh, Chris, Irish Republicans have always looked internationally, even at, at a time when it was difficult, even at a time when it wasn't as accessible to reach um, uh, international friends and supporters. Um, we've always done it. But now, obviously, Ireland has a huge diaspora. Um, it has, you know, there are 70 million people around the world who claim Irish uh, lineage and Irish heritage. Um, obviously, a large proportion of that is in uh, Canada and North America more generally. And I think, you know, in terms of even, you know, the experiences of, of you know, conflict and, and support for, for, for building peace, and you'll remember the presence of... Uh, General de Chastelin, um, going back in terms of our peace process, he oversaw uh, the decommissioning uh, of paramilitary weapons uh, from within loyalism. He oversaw the decommissioning of IRA weapons, all part of the peace process. So Canada has been present 
in this process. It has been present in you know a long period of Irish uh, history. There is a uh, an Irish community here, but we're not speaking to them exclusively. I mean, I took the opportunity in Vancouver yesterday to meet a range of of elected uh, officials. Um, and to tell them about uh, Ireland, um, to tell them about what's happening uh, currently, and really to tell them and ask for their support for the call for a referendum on Irish unity, which is, as I said, is part of an agreed uh, provision of the Good Friday Agreement. That agreement's lodged at the European Union, it's lodged at the United Nations, the British and Irish government are co-guarantors of that agreement. You know, the US has a particular vested interest in that and very much as I think Pre President Biden has said sees themselves as a guarantor of that agreement as well as do the European institutions because the European institutions were key in terms of the very early days of the peace process in investing in communities in funding infrastructural projects that really um, ensured that once you know demilitarization along the border happened and the British army were you know vacated from along the border and those security posts that European money could support really progressive popular uh, infrastructure investments that ensured that border really became invisible um, and while it was there I suppose from a political legislative territorial uh, point of view um, many of us you know never did don't and won't ever recognize that border <laughs> But it's much easier for people who maybe don't have the same politics that I would hold when it really isn't visible and doesn't impact on their day-to-day -day lives. So that's why people were so worried about Brexit. And that's why Brexit came so to the fore in terms of its potential impact uh, on Ireland. And that's why I think it was so important that early on in the negotiations that there were agreed principles between the UK government, between the European Union, that ensured that there would be no threat to the Good Friday Agreement, that there would be no return to a hard border. And that's why it's so reckless that the British government are now it's not particularly surprising to Irish people, given our experience, are regressing from those commitments. They seem determined um, to take us down a path that would um, jeopardize the Good Friday Agreement, that could potentially uh, see a uh, hardening of a border uh, in Ireland. And this is all after a protocol which they signed up to, they agreed, they put through their parliament, and now they want to say, one British minister uh, actually said that they would be prepared to break that agreement, to break the law, if I'm quoting them correctly, in a limited and specific way. Now, is this the, and I apologize because uh, there was just a transition of pro governments mm -hmm. from uh, Boris Johnson to Liz Truss. Is this the Liz Truss government we're talking this about? This was the Boris is, Johnson. Is this, uh, the, so do, does the uh, Irish uh, government and the people of the uh, uh, yourself like a senator, uh, do they do they have some better feeling with this current new United Kingdom prime minister, or is there still apprehension because it's same party, different face? Well, it, it's it's very early days into the term, uh, and obviously the term is going to be uh, dominated over the next short while with obviously the death of of Queen Elizabeth II. And um, so, I suppose in many ways we have to wait and see. Liz Truss has been involved in this process; she's been the foreign uh, secretary, uh, and she has led. Um, the British side of negotiations uh, for uh, quite some time now. Um, I have to say her rhetoric throughout the course of our her leadership campaign uh, wasn't particularly settling. Um, she has appointed a, a Secretary of State for the North of Ireland and a Junior Minister uh, for, for the North of Ireland, both of whom are former chairs of the European Research Group, which is quite a diehard Brexit cadre within the British Tory party. So I think that sends a particular signal of intent uh, at this stage. But I do remain confident that with international goodwill, solidarity uh, from places like Canada, from the European Union, who are remaining steadfast uh, in protecting the Good Friday Agreement, protecting Irish interests, and indeed uh, statements from uh, President Biden and uh, Congressman Richard Neal and others. Have you heard anything from Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, or any elect a major elected official that have come out in support of a referendum type situation where they would see a unification of Northern Ireland and Ireland? Well, I, I know that friends of Sinn Féin here in Canada have been engaging whether we're here or not, they, they, they continue to engage with elected officials. They have received a number uh, of endorsements from elected officials from it, and it's bipartisan, uh, by the way, uh, for uh, that referendum uh, going forward. And that's part of what I'm asking people to do here uh, now, not to take necessarily a particular stance on the outcome of that referendum, 
I suppose what we're saying is give us the opportunity to have our say. Next year, uh, the Good Friday Agreement uh, will reach a quarter of a century uh, in terms of coming of age. Uh, so there is a generation that has grown up uh, post-conflict in a peace process um, and they want to have the opportunity to have their say on this important issue and particularly post-Brexit when such fundamental things that, that, that were taken for granted and taken for red um, have been thrown up in the air. There are people who wouldn't come from the tradition and the community that I come from, uh, would come from the unionist community and, and have their allegiance to the United Kingdom, but they valued their European identity, they valued their European citizenship, they valued the benefits and the entitlements that membership of the European Union brought uh, to them personally, to their families, to their community, and they don't, you know, the, 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 the very ultra-nationalist British approach of the Tories in London doesn't chime uh, with them. So while they don't necessarily want to give up their Britishness, they don't want to give up their allegiance to Britain's royal family, for example, you know, they, they don't want to give up their, their, their own culture and their own traditions. They are starting to ask the questions about, OK, well, what would life look like for me? in a united Ireland, uh, in, in, in a reunified situation. And, and, and certainly for those of us who advocate for Irish unity, we have to sit down and engage and plan out uh, appropriately, uh, prepare for that change and reassure people that, you know, there won't be a replication of what was done onto us and those who come from my tradition onto anyone else in, in that scenario. So that's why I think planning and preparing for a referendum is so key and why the Irish government really need to step up to the mark in terms of that. Because if Brexit showed us one thing, it's how not to do a referendum. It's how not to ask an important constitutional question. You know, you don't go into this blind. You don't go into this with lies painted across the side of a big red bus. Um, you go in here with the correct detail, with the correct information, with the proper engagement uh, and with, I think, the very necessary uh, interaction and conversation uh, and reconciliation between communities. Does it give the people of Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, sort of a uh, sense of hope mm -hmm. that there is a referendum that is upcoming in 2023 in Scotland, whether they want to separate, that we could potentially see a referendum on this reunification mm. issue and put it out and settle it once and for all. Whether it may go one way or the other, we need to have the referendum because until we do, people are just going to keep on talking about it and nothing's ever going to change until actually people have the ability to vote. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, not, not to be cheesy or cliched about it, I actually think hope is, is really key to it all uh, because what, what we have in Ireland is something that the Scots would give their right arm for. And that is an actual agreed provision for a referendum. You know, we have it within the Good Friday Agreement, albeit it's within the gift of the Secretary of State to trigger that referendum. We have it. And, and, and there are so many pillars of what was understood to be accepted in, in perpetuity. Those pillars have fallen. The political unionist uh, majority, which was meant to be inbuilt into the state when it was formed just 101 years ago has gone over the last number of uh, legislative assembly elections Westminster elections and indeed when we had last uh, European elections the political unionist majority is gone it, it, and that wasn't meant to happen Sinn Féin is now the largest party in the north uh, of Ireland Michelle O'Neill our party vice president is the first minister designate uh, so that sends a signal in of itself that fundamentals have changed. And I think people are up for it, particularly younger people, when they don't just look at the historic obligation of Irish unity, but when, when they look at you know the big societal changes that have taken place uh, in the south of Ireland around marriage equality, around the repeal of the Eighth Amendment and, and a woman's right to choose. Um, th th those are all issues that have shown that, you know, what people maybe understood as, as Irish society, you know, possibly quite devout Catholic great wing isn't necessarily the case anymore. And, and when you couple that with the potential of, of, of Irish unity and actually starting a new, reimagining a new Ireland, uh, it's not just about, OK, well, let's bolt the north onto the south and the south onto the north and hope for the best. That's why we're advocating for, you know, 
this being our decade of opportunity that we that we do initiate the necessary planning the necessary engagement the necessary research and look to other examples around the world of constitutional change where similar referenda uh, and change has taken taken place so there's a lot of hope uh, in there and it isn't just talking about I don't think and I don't sense when I engage with people out there and certainly not from the perspective of my own party it's not just about let's talk simply about removing the border it's talking about what kind of healthcare system uh, we want how do we deal with the acute housing problem uh, for for people out there just what seems to be the unattainable uh, prospect of, of having a, a home of your own for many many people let's talk about the energy crisis and how we uh, create our own sustainable uh, energy sources uh, in Ireland and utilize the abundance uh, of natural uh, resources that are there uh, for us as opposed to in the past selling them off to the highest bidder um, so that's the kind of I, I think conversation that first of all needs to happen but I think it's also a conversation that people are up for because whether it's north or south people want a change people are, are, are hungry for a change because the current system uh, the current arrangements um, really aren't delivering uh, for them so we have this opportunity you know other countries around the world would probably love to talk about the opportunity of change that we have we have the opportunity to reimagine Ireland as a real republic as a republic that guarantees uh, you know religious and civil liberty uh, as the proclamation of our own independence that says that, that we cherish all the children of the nation equally. Do you think if there was a referendum held today, you'd win? I would hope so. I'd want to win it. I'd work my backside <laughs> off to win it. Uh, to be Always the million honest. dollar question. Um, but but I, I suppose you go into every election not knowing uh, the outcome. Uh, but rest assured, certainly... Like, is there a want and a need yes. right now that people are saying, okay enough's enough let's let's put it on the line and let's have the referendum the momentum the momentum around that is something that i have not experienced in my lifetime uh, and i am someone who no matter what political forum or chamber i entered no matter what room i entered <laughs> the the advocating for irish unity was always front and center in my political mind um but there isn't a day now where you don't have the launch of another academic research paper or an economic uh, paper or another politician coming out, uh, whether domestically or internationally, mm -hmm. saying that, you know, we need this change. You have a huge mobilization around civic society uh, in, in, in the north and, and throughout Ireland. Um, you have people within uh, sports uh, all coming out and saying, look, we need to have this conversation. The prudent thing to do, the leaderly thing to do, the responsible thing to do is to have this conversation. If Brexit again has taught us anything, it's that we can't jump into this on a whim, that, that we need to ensure that, particularly those of us who who want to win it, that we win it as best we can. But even if we don't necessarily champion that referendum, there are people there who might be somewhat kind of indifferent, but they want to have all of the information at hand when it comes to making the vote. I think even, you know, even probably the most diehard opponent, you know, would still be an opponent, but they recognize that whether it's in a year or whether it's in five years, th this question is going to be asked because, you know, societal changes, demographic changes, political, economic changes are all taking place uh, around us. Um, I, I, you know, you're in a rush to get to your next event and have lunch here in Calgary. Well, first off, welcome to Calgary. I guess Thank I should you. have said that beforehand. No, no. Um, literally just fresh off the plane. Literally <laughs> fresh off the plane. He, he, his first stop was the cross-border interviews. That's right. We're going international. Um, I want to ask one last question, and sure. then we're going to pitch your event that's coming up tomorrow mm. in Okotoks. Um, we are in a transition in england right now mm. and in uh, the united kingdom uh queen elizabeth ii did meet with the leader at the time uh, Sinn Féin, and they shook hands mm -hmm. and this was a huge step forward for mending those relationships yeah. um is this movement from the government that is not really doing anything right now on the realm of this uh uh how do i put this correctly uh this referendum that you want called um gonna be sort of not even at anyone's radar probably for the next two three years because of the transition from queen elizabeth to king charles now well i mean first of all like i i, I acknowledge the deep loss that people are feeling uh, not least in canada um but but at home in ireland and indeed uh, in britain at the loss uh, of of queen elizabeth you're right to mention uh, i think the very significant 
uh, symbolic steps that she took uh, when she visited Dublin uh, initially um, and bowed her head uh, in uh, honour uh, of the people who fought for Irish freedom. That was a very significant uh, acknowledgement and I think it's it's one that resonated with me and, 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 and people uh, like me as well. I don't think, I think you would be a, a terribly begrudging person if you were to you know not acknowledge the significance uh, of that um i'm of course i'm a republican and will advocate uh, for republican uh, politics um but we we are in a period now where people will be feeling a deep sense uh, of loss uh, and i acknowledge uh, and recognize that and, and, and extend my sympathies uh, to them do i think the momentum about this issue can be held back will it dissipate no, uh, I, I think the genie is out of the bottle uh, in relation to the question of Irish uh, reunification and that is going to remain uh, front and centre uh, of politics in Ireland and it will have uh, a big presence uh, in British and, and European and broader international uh, politics going forward uh, as well. But I acknowledge we're in a period now where, where uh, you know, lots of people will be mourning uh, the loss uh, of Queen Elizabeth. It's a difficult time for her family but she she did meet martin mcginnis um a former uh, ira leader um uh, our, our chief negotiator throughout the peace process and deputy first minister for uh, a a number of uh, of years in in the north of ireland uh martin unfortunately is no longer with us uh either he passed away a number of years ago uh too uh but again the our our, our current leaders uh in Sinn Féin, mary lou mcdonald and michelle o'neill uh have met with uh, Queen Elizabeth before her passing, have met uh, with then Prince Nye, Nye King Charles, uh, all of whom have been prepared to play a role uh, in improving relations between Britain and Ireland and indeed in taking uh, uh, steps towards reconciliation. And to be fair, I think we have uh, not just acknowledged that, but have reciprocated uh, that hand as as Irish Republicans and our own experience of, of loss and, and hurt caused by what... The British royal family and the British monarch are em emblematic of yeah. what they're symbolic uh, of. Uh, so that's part of nation building. That's part of peace. That's part of reconciliation. And I think we, we have shown by example uh, that Sinn Féin and Irish Republicans are up for that. Last question. You are uh, in Vancouver last night. You're mm -hmm. in Okotoks tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, part of the Friends of the Sinn Féin Canada. Uh, you are going to be at the Crystal Ridge Golf Club, and mm. I just want to make sure I read this. Nine Crystal Green Lakes, Okotoks, Alberta, Saturday, September 10th from 4 to 7. Mm -hmm. Who can come? Is it open to anyone? Is it open for everyone and anyone to show up? And it, it's open to everyone who has who has an interest in Ireland, who has an interest in the peace process, who may not even know the first thing about Ireland, but just want to come along and learn a bit more. Um, I, I've visited Canada a number of times. I was over on the far side uh, <laughs> before I've been to... Toronto a number of times, I've been to Ottawa a number of times, I've been to Montreal uh, a number of times, and this is my first time on this side uh, of, of the country. So this and is your first visit to Calgary? This is my first visit to Calgary. Oh, you have and it was lots my, to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I'm looking Peter's forward to it. Peter's driving right yeah, here yeah. right now. Tell me, where the, tell me where the best coffee is. Uh, Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons. <laughs> do you know, we even have Tim Hortons in Belfast now oh. too, believe it or not, uh, and it's very popular. Um, but yeah, it's open to uh, everyone and anyone. Where uh, I mean, I welcome the opportunity. I had a great public meeting in uh, Vancouver last night where we had people from the Irish community, recent immigrants uh, from Ireland to Vancouver, and also people who have just always had a, a great gra, what we call in Irish, a, gr a great love for, for Ireland and just want to see, you know, that historic obligation uh, and, and job of reuniting the country in peace, in reconciliation, fulfilled. So... To Falcher Rove, you're very welcome. Uh, come along, and, and I look forward to seeing as many people as possible uh, tomorrow night. Awesome. So remember, that's uh, Saturday, September 10th from 4 to 7 at the Crystal Ridge Golf Club in Okotoks. If you want, head out because it will probably be a fun night. It will be three hours with the senator. He spent a half hour here, and I appreciate everything you've done, even to sit down with you for a half hour. It's been a wonderful experience. So thank you so much, Niall. Thank you, Chris. So with that, I want to remind everyone, get out from behind social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody because you know what? Twitter is not the end-all, be-all of what Canada is all about. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, keep talking, everyone.